Feroz Chihirovic knows that any given morning might be his daughter's last. All nine of his children are slowly being poisoned. Many parents know how tall or how heavy their kids are. Some may even know their IQ. But Flonza and her husband Feroz know how much lead is in their children's blood. There's no safe level for lead in the human body. Brain damage is thought to start at around 10 micrograms of lead per deciliter of blood. These children have four to five times that amount. Sadly, the Jehirovic children are not unusual among the Roma refugees living here in Mitrovica. In 2005, you took hair samples from all the children in the camps and sent them to a laboratory in Chicago for testing. What did they say to you about what they found? They, they called me. Uh, they didn't believe the results. They did it three times. They told me these are the uh, highest levels they've measured uh, in human hair worldwide. It should be no surprise that the highest lead levels ever recorded have been found in camps built next to Europe's largest lead mine. I'm standing on around 150 million tonnes of toxic waste. Below me are the Chessman Lug and Osterode refugee camps, where 150 gypsy families breathe in the lead dust that blows through this valley every day. They've been here for more than nine years. Perhaps the most shocking part of this story is the fact that the Roma have been let down by the very people charged with protecting them. It was the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, the UNHCR, which first housed the Roma on toxic land. And it was the United Nations mission in Kosovo, or UNMIC, which governed here for almost nine years. Why has it taken so long to find a lasting solution for these people? Actually, it's a, it's a good question, but the, it, it's got, the answer is very complex. I think that the, the, the UN had its hands tied by the overall problems affecting the region. Could you blame them for feeling bitter? 
Absolutely, I would uh, absolutely I would feel uh, the same. There's no doubt about that. Over the centuries, the Roma have done their best to avoid persecution by fitting in with their neighbours. Like Kosovo's Albanians, most of the families here are Muslim. But the Jehirovic's faith didn't protect them from ethnic cleansing in 1999. A few years ago, Feruz Jehirovic took a filmmaker to see the ruins of his home. These two big houses were his. This was his and the second one was of his brother. During the war in 1999, Albanians forced Feruz and his neighbours out of their homes, accusing them of collaborating with the Serbs. They had very beautiful life. They had every possibility. He doesn't want to go, he cannot see it. Eight thousand people lived here once. It was the largest Roma community in Kosovo. Just over the river we're coming up to the old gypsy neighborhood called Fabrichka. Paul Polanski has been campaigning for Mitrovice's Roma ever since the war. He first met them shortly after they'd fled to the Serbian side of the city. This is where I found the Roma camped out in August 1999. 800 of them in this school building camped out on the grounds. It was a real disaster, this scene. They hadn't had water, hygiene products or food for many weeks. When the local authorities wanted the school back, the UNHCR arranged to house the families in tents just outside of town. That first site was only a few metres away from some of the slag heaps. So I protested. I said, anybody can see with the naked eye. This is toxic wasteland. You can't put them here. And they assured me they would only be here for 45 days. I just sort of held my breath and said, OK, 45 days. They'll probably be taken to another country. They'll have a better life. And uh, it was left at that in September 1999. What happened then? What happened to the 45 days? Well, it came and went. And 10 years later, we're still here. The United Nations health officer in Mitrovica took the first blood tests back in 2000, and his report recommended moving the Roma camp. Unmik didn't heed this advice, but it did show some concern for the well-being of the local community. In 2003, the UN built a soccer field, a basketball court and a jogging track, all on toxic land right across from the lead slag heap. The gypsies were encouraged to exercise here, which would mean opening up their lungs and increasing the amount of lead dust they were inhaling. The UN called this the Alley of Health. They knew something was wrong, but everybody has this great faith in the UN. And many times the, the people would say to me, if there was something wrong, the UN would save us, the UN would treat us. It was the death of a child in 2004 that brought home the terrible risk of bringing up children in the camps. Four-year-old Janita Memeti had started losing her memory and was complaining about pain in her legs. After spending three months in hospital, she died. 
and suddenly every family realized that they had a Janita. They saw their children losing their memories. They saw all the symptoms of lead poisoning. They didn't know it was lead poisoning, but they saw the symptoms and they all became petrified, especially the mothers. And did they come and talk to you about this? Yes. What would they say to you? Save our children. Something's wrong. Save our children. In 2004, the World Health Organization took more blood tests and called for UNMIC to immediately evacuate the camps. Two years later, they decided to close the worst of the two camps and move them into a, a former French NATO base that had been abandoned by the French because of high levels of lead poisoning. Yeah. <laughs> Manchester United. This is Osterod, the former French NATO barracks. It's only a hundred meters from the Chessman Lug camp. But after laying down concrete and providing clean drinking water, the UN declared it was a lead safer environment. If you compare it to a, a safe environment in Australia, Clearly, Osterod is uh, not the best place, but if you compare to uh, what currently is the case, it is uh, a much better alternative for them. As a, again, as purely a temporary measure that can be done immediately. This seems like it was only a very cosmetic solution. You say it was short term, but they were originally told in 1999 they were being moved for 45 days. That was short term. In 2006, they were moved to Osterod, and this was a short term solution. It's now three years later. It's always a, a challenge for us who are not uh, having our own taxpayers but are relying on international donors. Vera Obradovic is a local nurse who provides the only health care at Osterod. Although this is Europe's worst ever case of lead poisoning, there are no doctors here, no specialist equipment, and no ongoing medical treatment. The nurse stresses the importance of good hygiene, which can help reduce lead contamination. <laughs> When the families first moved to Osterod, there was a program to provide them with a better diet. And for a few months, the children received chelating tablets, special pills used to treat lead poisoning. There is no food, there is almost no medical care, there are families scavenging for their food in garbage cans. Yes. Your language is very careful, but are you not shocked on some level? Are you not horrified by the situation that these families find themselves in after so long? Absolutely. Despite the miserable conditions, the World Health Organization says the move to Osterod was a success because the average lead levels of the families here have decreased. Oh, 
but the levels of some Roma have actually risen, and the rest still have blood levels the WHO classes as mildly high. When you say mildly high, what, what sort of figures are you it's talking 20, about? It's 20, 17, 7, 12. But g given that irreversible brain damage is thought to take place at around 10 micrograms per deciliter, clearly even 17 or 20. Definitely. It is, it is health emergency, definitely. So how is it that after all these years, nothing has been done? Part of the problem is political. Last year, the UN handed over control to Kosovo's government. But North Mitrovica is in a Serb enclave that wants to be part of Serbia, not an independent Kosovo. The hostility means that whenever Paul crosses the river to the city's north, he removes his Kosovo number plates or risks being stoned by the local Serbs. In recent years, the international community has started rebuilding the Roma Mahala, their old neighbourhood. But many Roma don't want to live next to the people who force them out. They're also worried about losing access to social security and health care in Serbia. The UN, along with Kosovo's new government, is still hoping to persuade the families to move to the Mahala. They've even suggested that force may be used if necessary but they don't believe there's any quick fix to this medical emergency. A lasting solution uh, for all families will uh, uh, take uh, a couple of years. But, a couple uh, of years? Yes. If this situation was happening in Australia or in Norway, do you think that the, the argument would be the same? Do you think it would take a couple of years to sort out? Well, you know, you have to have facilities uh, to also uh, put them in, uh, for sure. Uh, there are resources that are available in uh, Australia, in Norway and uh, in the Western countries are fortunately a lot better than uh, what currently is the case uh, in, uh, in Kosovo. The World Health Organization is now calling for immediate measures and when I sit down and talk to UNDP or INMIC they're talking about a two-year time frame. Is, yeah. is two years an immediate measure when you're no. facing an, a medical emergency? No, immediate as immediate is now. It's now. Are you disappointed that they are not talking about doing that? I'm very disappointed that I'm, I don't see results. Talking is not enough. I, I want to see results. The international community accepted a duty of care for these families and it has failed them. Well, I think that some humanitarian relief has been provided in all these years. They, they got a better diet for a few months and then the funding for that program was cut. Many of the families I met are still scavenging for their daily food in the garbage bins of Mitrovica. Believe me, uh, we are not claiming that the situation is ideal. We are not claiming that uh, the, uh, the situation could have been dealt with in a different manner. Today, the Roma are mourning the 80th death in these camps. Enver Rushiti was 33 years old. He suffered from schizophrenia. And this morning, he died of a sudden attack of diabetes that had gone undiagnosed. Wow. 
The Serbian doctor who treated him says lead, which weakens the body's immune system, could have been a contributing factor. All his father knows is that he's lost a son. Many of the Roma are afraid that life in the camps is a death sentence. Feruz is convinced the only way his children will get the medical treatment they need is if they're resettled in another country. But the UN says resettlement abroad is difficult. Because the Roma are still technically in Kosovo, they're not considered refugees. Do you not think there would be a case for approaching other countries and explaining the circumstances to them? The first reaction probably of those countries would be that uh, these people could be resettled within uh, Serbia, that uh, a safe site could be identified within Serbia. Clearly it hasn't been. It's been almost 10 years a safe site has not been found, so surely you could explain that to them. Has the easier, UNHCR... Has easier the... said than done, believe me. As more most the lead doesn't just kill adults and children. Pregnant women in the camps know how dangerous it can be for the unborn child. No. No. Some, despite strong cultural taboos, try to induce a miscarriage or even give themselves an abortion rather than give birth to a brain-damaged child. Feroz and Flonza pray for their children's health, but after so many years and so many broken promises, they're no longer confident their prayers will be answered. Their youngest child, Sarah, sometimes loses consciousness and they take it in turns every night to watch over her. What's been the lowest point for you in this whole struggle? Burying the children. What will happen if the families here are not evacuated? We won't have another generation. This will be the end of these gypsies. Are people surprised when you tell them about this story? No one believes it. No one believes it. Unless they see it with their own eyes, no one believes it. Shh. 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 Shh.
Eyvallah, Allah'a emanet olun.